In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mother of divine grace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the last class, we talked about the, the gifts of the Holy Ghost, which should be on the internet here within about the next week and a half. But uh, the gifts are, of course, God's operations in us. That is, he actually does certain things in us. We have no control over them. Um, we can't make use of them. He just may, he uses us as the what St. Thomas calls the primary mover. He moves us by to do certain things. And then that's, of course, him moving us. But then there are certain effects of the presence of the Holy Ghost. And these effects, St. Thomas says, are acts or perfections which become manifest. So once a person's in the state of grace and starts excelling, that is increasing their state of grace, removing all of their imperfections, as their imperfections begin to be removed, certain effects become manifest in um, the person's life. And there's these, these are more tangible. They're things that are more easily seen. Um, they're not tangible in the sense that you can feel them and touch them, etc. But there are some things that can be perceived more readily than, say, gifts of the Holy Ghost, which oftentimes the person does not know that it's God acting through them. And they have to be careful with that, of course, because then you get, as I mentioned in the class, a certain movement that thinks that they can flail around around on the ground and call it holy hilarity and somehow it's a gift of the Holy Ghost. That's not how these things function. They are, in fact, the gifts of the Holy Ghost. They are instruction in a specific way, but so you can read, listen to that conference uh, if you like. But the fruits of the Holy Ghost, St. Thomas says, a fruit is, once a person again reaches a certain level of sanctified perfection, these fruits start to become more manifest and much more operative. So sometimes people will notice that their interior life, there's not much peace in their interior life, or um, they might struggle with chastity, and that's actually a sign that they haven't reached a certain level of perfection. As a person advances and becomes more holy, then there are certain effects just that naturally flow from God's presence in us. In order to increase the fruits in ourselves, okay, we have to observe a few things. First, fidelity to grace. And this has been somewhat of a theme throughout the course of these talks, that you always have to be faithful to any grace that God sends you. Ignoring any grace will end up causing you to not reach that level of perfection that God intends for you. Um, you have to remove any impediments to the operations of the virtues and the gifts. So you have to get rid of all your defects, commonly called vices. So you get rid of those, and then these things become more active. We must strive for excellence and grace. So the more sanctifying grace you have, the more the fruits become manifest. St. Thomas makes the observation that a fruit has a twofold aspect to it. The first is, is that it's the final stage in perfection. That is, the, it's the thing that you notice in the final stages. So, um, for example, the fruit, you don't have fruit until a plant gets to a certain level of maturity, and then there, the fruit starts coming from that, and the, the more mature the, the plant is, the more fruit that can come from it, etc. So it's, it more, it's, a, it's a sign of perfection of the later stages. The second thing is, is that it has a certain sweetness about it. And the fruits of the Holy Ghost, when a person reaches a certain stages of perfection, there's a certain sweetness that begins to take over the spiritual life. A lot of times people find the spiritual life very difficult, and it's because of their imperfections. Um, they find it a struggle. They find there's not much reward. Usually there's sensible consolations in the beginning, and then God starts taking those away from people, so they begin to go through a period of purification, and they wonder why they're not experiencing these things anymore. But it's not until they get start excelling in grace that they start noticing these perfections, and there's a certain sweetness that they gain from that. There are 12 fruits. Oh, it's also something which you take delight in. So the sweetness is something that you actually delight. So these fruits, which we're going to be talking about, as a person experiences them, there's a, a level of delight that you gain from it. So there's 12 of them. The first is charity. So if you remember from our discussion of the infused virtues, 
as a person excels or is in the state of grace, God infuses all of the infused virtues, which include not just faith, hope, and charity, but also the infused moral virtues. So, but it infuses charity. And as a person begins to advance, as he begins to increase his state of grace, that is to increase how much sanctifying grace he has, uh, other virtues, the infused virtues, become greater and stronger and more manifest. And one of these is charity. So as you become holier, the more charity the person actually has. The soul, St. Thomas says, with respect to charity, is disposed in itself when it relates properly to good and evil. And the first disposition of the human soul to the good is through love, which is the first affection and the root of all the other affections. And basically what that means is that for St. Thomas... First, I'll explain it in light of the emotions, and then we can talk about it with respect to the affections in the broader sense. St. Thomas says that the passion of love, now passion of love is any like that you have for something. So, for example, here people say, I love steak, or I love chocolate. And so when they see the chocolate, there's a certain, just in, the, in apprehending it, there's a certain delight that they get out of just looking at it. And that's a sign that they actually love the thing, which is different, of course, from desiring it or wanting it, which is the passion of desire. And then there's the um, passion of delight. That's when you actually experience the thing. You see this with kids, you know, they, they want the snack, and so you give them the snack, and they, they start smiling once they start eating the thing, of course. That is, those kinds of, those kinds of uh, emotions, there is also in the soul certain kinds of affections that have a certain similitude, and those are principally in the will. So the will can love, and what is love? Willing the good of another. We talked about this in relationship to charity. Charity is the virtue by which the person loves God, because we can't love God without charity. That is, love God for his own sake. We can only love God from what we get out of him. In other words, it's a selfish kind of a love of God from our own natural capacities. Whereas if we have charity, we're able to love God for his own sake. Just in and of himself, he's something worthy of love. And then loving our neighbor for the sake of God. Okay, so as a person becomes, increases in the in amount of grace that they have, then what happens is, is the amount of love that they have for God increases. Now a lot of people who are at, in the beginning stages of the spiritual life usually notice that they don't really love God that much. Or that their love for God tends to be because he gives them spiritual cookies from time to time or because he's giving them some type of consolation or he provides for them. But that is what the theologians call, it's, it's more of a, a selfish kind of a love. It's not necessarily disordered because we should turn to God to ask for certain things. But if we're seeking it purely for our own benefit, then it's not perfect. It's not um, a manifestation of charity. Whereas charity loves him for his own sake. So what St. Thomas says is that because the Holy Ghost is love, that is, it's the love of God the Father and God the Son for each other, that's what the Holy Ghost is, then as the Holy Ghost begins to become more present in us, that is, how, um, because of sanctifying grace, the Trinity indwells in us, and so the Holy Ghost is there, as it begins to increase, then there is a certain similitude between the love of God, that is, the Holy Ghost which is in us, and the love which we have for God through charity. So charity begins to increase so that we can love him more. So there's a certain um, proportion. Charity is the first fruit because all of the other fruits of the Holy Ghost flow from charity. Since charity is the love of God and love of neighbor for the sake of God, charity enables one to view all of the created order through the lens of God. And I've talked a little bit about this. It helps the person to always look at everything from the point of view of God. So as a person, as they increase, as they do the things necessary to increase their, the amount of sanctifying grace they have, then the effect of that is they start loving God more. And it's like everything else. When you love a thing a lot, like another person or something like that, you start looking at reality through that lens. So you, you see this from time to time with people who are married for, you know, for half a century or more, and then one, one, one of the other spouse dies, they're a bit at a loss because they've always considered life in relationship to the other person, and now that that person that they love is gone, they're, they're a bit lost. Well, that's a sign that um, when we really love God a great deal, we're st we start looking at everything from the point of view of God. And so what happens is the person begins to take on a more spiritual approach to their lives rather than just leading a mundane uh, life. Then the next one, 
So there's an increase. So as a person begins becomes holier, there's an increase in charity. And so one of the things that you know you can do to um, like if a person's suffering from anger, if you just find it's hard to be nice to people, etc. Because niceness is not exactly the same thing as charity. But if you find it hard to be kind, um, which we'll see a little bit later, is one of the fruits of the Holy Ghost. Then what you can do is do acts of charity. But you can also try and do those things necessary to merit an increase in sanctifying grace. So that the more grace you have then you'll just find, as time goes on, it's just easier to be kinder to people. People who find it really difficult in the beginning to be kind to people is because they had their, they're being kind of held back in a certain sense because their spiritual life isn't as advanced as it should be. That is, they're not, they don't have as much grace as they should. The next one is joy. St. Thomas says, every lover takes joy in being joined to the beloved. And so joy necessarily follows from charity. Since charity always has God present by means of sanctifying grace, then joy follows. We may also say that one takes joy in the good of charity, and this joy is delightful. Part of this has to do with the fact that as a person is always looking at everything from the point of view of God, since God is the, is the highest good, the thing that is good in itself, all other created things are only good because they somehow receive some goodness from God. And as we start looking at everything from the point of view of God, then looking at it from the point of view of the thing that we love and we're always looking at that, then as time goes on, we start seeing good everywhere, and as the good is present to us, then joy occurs as a result of that. So one of the things that is important for traditionalists, for example, is they're always walking around mulling over how bad everything is in the church. You know, so everyone's walking around with how bad everything is. Well, that's a sign that you're not looking at everything from the point of view of God. You're looking at it from a lack of a spiritual approach to it. Whereas if you're always looking at everything from the point of view of God... Even the evil things, even though they might cause a certain degree of suffering, it doesn't take away the joy of the, the, of the person. You see this, for instance, every so often I give conferences out at the Carmel in, um, in Valparaiso. And if you haven't been there, it's a place actually worth going to take a look at. You know, there's the Spanish colonial monastery right in the middle of Nebraska, you know, just sitting there as plain as day. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. But one of the things that struck me is there was a, a woman that entered the convent or the, the monastery in, um, when I was at the University of San Francisco. We were classmates, and she entered. And I saw her about, uh, ten, about nine years ago after she had been a nun for a number of years. And there was a certain radiance given off in her face, the joy that she could see. You could physically see the joy on her face from just being a nun. And this is something was because, you know, she spent a great deal of energy focusing on God. And you actually see this with the nuns there. The, the countenance actually begins to change. It's the same thing I see with the Carmelites up in Wyoming. You see guys enter, and as time goes on, their countenance begins to change. It becomes more, they almost give off a, a certain shine or an aura about them because of the fact that they're so focused on God. And this is a sign of the joy that they have in taking and um, considering the things of God all the time. The next, so joy is the result of the good being present to the appetitive faculty. So when we're, we're always thinking about God and we're always loving God, then that good that is present to our will causes joy. It doesn't necessarily mean that emotionally things are really calm, although that usually is also the case too. But, it's a, but it means that in our will there's a great deal of joy that a person is just happy very often most of the time. Then there is, the third one is peace which St. Augustine defines and which after him the entire moral tradition accepts as the tranquility of order. And this needs a bit of explanation. The perfection of joy is peace, St. Thomas says, and this is with respect to two things. The first is with respect to the quiet from external troubles, for one cannot take joy in a thing perfectly as if one is disturbed from the outside. When one's heart is made perfectly peaceful in one thing, that is, when one's heart comes to rest on one thing alone, he is not disturbed, for he thinks of other things as nothing. And what he means by that is a person becomes totally absorbed in God. Then what happens is, is, is the person becomes focused on that, and so whatever happens around him doesn't bother him, because he's, he still has this object of his delight, of his joy present to him, which is God. So he doesn't get disturbed by things outside of him. As a result, as one heart comes to rest in God alone through charity, then peace arises. In other words, the person isn't disturbed by anything. The second is that as one rests in God alone through charity, there is a quieting 
or a calming of the fluctuating desires. As when desires come to rest in God alone, one desires nothing else. So if you don't get anything else, it doesn't bother you. And on the other hand, as your charity becomes perfect, as you love God alone, it causes detachment. That's one of the effects of charity. You become detached from the cares of the world, from the things of this world. And there's the converse is true. If we're really attached to our house, to our, to our wife, or to certain other things, not that you shouldn't love your wife, but you should love her through charity, but um, that if you're really attached to created things, then what ends up happening is, is anytime something upsets those things or disturbs them, then we become interiorly disturbed. Whereas if we're, t and so the, our attachments to thing, if we find ourselves troubled, it's because we're attached to something. So you've got to find that thing that you're attached to and, and put it aside, and become detached from it, and that will cause an interior quieting as a result of it. And that's, one, that's the effect of peace. So as one desires becomes rest in God alone, one desires nothing else. Therefore, one's appetites will not vacillate. That is, what you desire won't change because you're always fixed in God. And therefore, the peace will overtake the soul. Now, what's that got to do with the tranquility of order? The tranquility of order is this. Tranquility, of course, is a quiet. It's the lack of disturbance, but it's a certain quiet that results from order. And what's this order? When we're created, God places in us, St. Thomas says, natural inclinations towards things. In other words, God directs us and orders us towards certain things, such as marriage, food, living in common. He says, to know the truth about God, to live in society. These are the types of things that we have natural inclinations for. Well, what happens is, is that um, one of the, the, all these created things that were ordered towards, like food, or conjugal relations, or marriage, or living in common, he says, are all, or they're all participated goods, as I mentioned before. In other words, they're good only because they are approximate end, that is, they somehow refer to God. And so these things are only good because there's some reflection or some perfection in God is manifest in them, so that in reality, even though we're ordered towards these things, approximately, that is, um, the thing that's closest to us, Nevertheless, that ordering is ultimately really an ordering to God in the end, because these things are only good because they're somehow like God. So in the end, we're really after God. What happens is, is when we become really strong in charity, that is, when we really become focused in God, then this principal object of our ordering, that is God, because all these other things are means to God, then that object is present, so that the ordering which is in us is directed towards this object, God, so that when we love God alone, then what happens is a certain tranquility overtakes us. Why? Because of the fact that we're now ordered, we're now attached to the one object to which we are properly ordered. Now, where does this, what's, it seems a bit ethereal, but let me give you the, the opposite and that will help explain this a bit. Since we're ordered towards God, then if we start pursuing other things, not for their, uh, if we pursue other things for the sake of God, then it still falls under God, so it's, it's okay. But when we start pursuing other things for their own sake, then we bifurcate what we're actually ordered towards. And you see this very often when people, um, you know, they want one thing, they want, or there's a few things and they're not sure what they want. They're like running back and forth, they're not sure, and there's a certain disturbance interiorly as a result of this. So the disturbance in the soul, the disturbance is the result of two conflicting things trying to take over our interior life or externally. Like, for instance, there's a lack of peace in a country because there's opposites or things that are fighting against each other within the two different agents working within the country, whereas if there's just one and everyone is focused on the same object, then there's a certain order, and um, order is a directing towards a particular thing, then there's a peace. Well, it's the same thing in our interior life. Because we're ordered to God, then if we pursue anything other than that thing, we will always have an interior lack of quiet. That's why St. Augustine, of course, who gave us this definition there, so when we love God alone, then our soul interiorly is now ordered towards the thing in all of its aspects to the thing which we are ultimately ordered towards, which is God, and so there's a peace that results in it. And St. Augustine says, our hearts shall not rest until they rest in thee referring to God because of the fact that there's not going to be any peace 
or fullness of peace, we should say, until we are totally consumed by God. And this is why you'll actually see that, you know, you go into these convents where, where the nuns are praying all the time and they're leading very holy lives. They're just very peaceful and nothing, you know, they're inf- unflappable, nothing bothers them. Whereas if there is some attachment that we have, then there's something that's fighting for our affection other than God. And as a result, we're split. And then there's a lack of peace. The next is patience. Now, usually people get patience a bit confused. Patience is the fourth of those fruits, yet it follows the prior three due to the fact that patience deals with evil rather than good. So it principally deals with things that are evil that usually causes some kind of suffering. Patience comes from the Latin word patire, which means to suffer. Well, peace keeps one from being disturbed by desires in relationship to the good. Patience keeps the soul from being disturbed by the imminence that is the presence of evil. Patience is a constancy of the soul (coughs) in that the soul is not broken with respect to itself. It's a kind of self-possession when even though evil things are happening to it, the person remains in control of themselves. When the act of patience occurs in the soul as a fruit of the Holy Ghost, the person remains constant and unbroken in his equanimity, despite the evils which occur to him from, uh, to him or outside of him. So what happens is, is the person is able to suffer a lot of things, and it doesn't bother them. Because they're so focused on God, these things, that if they come and they go, it doesn't bother them because the object of their affection is still always there because they're still loving God. The next is long-suffering. Oh, so incidentally, if you want to increase your patience, you have to become holier. Start working on charity, and then the natural effect of that will be patience. Then the next one is long-suffering. But that's a bit of a mistranslation, actually. The word is, there is an actual word, langanimitas, or langamity is it? English term, that's the Latin term, is langanitas. It literally means longness of soul. Long suffering or longness of soul is the fruit which orders the soul in itself with respect to evil so that the soul is not disturbed by the delay of good things. In other words, the lack of getting some good thing is an evil to us. And so what happens is, is the person becomes more perfected the longness of soul begins to become present in them, and so they can wait a long time to receive what is good. Now, usually in English parlance, we tell you know the kid he's can't, he can't wait. You know, you tell him be patient, but that's not that's actually somewhat of a misuse of the term patience, because patience is you know suffering of evils, whereas this is waiting for the good. And so, as a person becomes holier, they're able to wait for good things more easily. Yeah. Good things, as in, for instance. Well, anything, anything, that, anything that's created good, you know, if the food is waiting on the table, you can wait for it. Oh, okay. You don't have to, you know, come on, let's eat, let's eat, you know. Um, it's also the type of thing of, uh, you know, when the light is red, you can just sit there. You can wait for it until it's very pretty. Okay, so this is something that you can do uh, to, so if, as you begin to become holier, you'll be able to wait for good things longer. The sixth is benevolence. Sometimes you'll see this called goodness. Now what benevolence is, it comes from the Latin words bonus voldere, which means literally to will the good. The benevolent person is the person who always wills the good. But in this particular case, as a fruit of the Holy Ghost, it disposes the soul to willing the good for one's neighbor. And this is important because you'll see sometimes people will come to church and they'll say, well, I love God, but I can't stand my neighbor. (laughs) Well, it's a sign, again, you're not holy and you haven't reached perfection yet. And so the person has to actually um, work on becoming holier, and then this will come. Goodness means that we want to do good things we want. It's on the side of the want. We want to do good things for those around us, and this fruit is called sweetness of soul. By this fruit, the soul's right order towards one neighbor becomes present, and the good willed toward the good willed towards the person takes on a certain sweetness in two ways. The first is with respect to self, as the person who possesses this fruit finds willing the good of his neighbor delightful. So, just doing good for people, he takes a certain delight in it. The second is that it makes one delightful to other people 
since this fruit wills the good of the other, which is manifested in the person's own actions. So in other words, we can just tell there's certain people of goodwill. That, you know, they're, 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 they're you know, the man of no guile. He's never there to deceive us. He's never there to take advantage of us. He's always trying to seek what is good. And you see, there's certain people that are just, you know, they're just good people. Be- one, because one wills to do good things for others, then this fruit helps us to forgive those who have done evil to us. It's also the fruit which helps us to, regardless of what evil we're suffering, to always seek what is spiritually best for people in that particular moment. You know, even if they're, you know, hacking at us, chewing on us, being angry with us, they, the person can put themselves entirely aside because they're loving God and they're loving their neighbor and so they're seeking what's best rather than just seeking to vent themselves. The next is benignity, sometimes called kindness. While the fruit of the Holy Ghost of goodness enacts good will on the side of the person who has it, benignity executes that good will through action, which is why sometimes it's called beneficence, which comes from the Latin words bonus facere, which means to do good. In other words, it is, it is one thing to will something it is another thing to actually do it. And this fruit moves the person to do those things necessary for our neighbor's good rather than just willing them. St. Thomas observes that the benign uh, are those who do the good for the fervent fire of love for the doing of the good for one's neighbor. In other words, the person burns through charity, that is, they burn for love of God and love of neighbor, and so they not just want to will the good for people, they'll actually do it for, for other people. Through benignity, the person burns with a desire to do good for people, and he comes to the aid of those in the state of need. St. Thomas observes that benignity moves one to eradicate evil by doing the good. So as I mentioned, you know, it doesn't matter what other people are doing to you, you're trying to seek what's good in those particular moments. In so doing, benignity makes the person live well with others. In other words, the guy who's, looking, who's always doing good things for us, they're a great person to live around. For this, from this, we see two things. The first is that insofar as we do the good, we are ordering things towards the good or even God himself, at least remotely. For this reason, benignity is sometimes called the spirit of wisdom because it's an ordering. It orders things to their right ends, which is part of what wisdom does. And, to order, and it pertains to wisdom to see and order things to God. Second, since it wills to do the good to others, benignity is contrary to envy. Insofar as envy is a vice in which one desires the good of another, not for the sake of the other person, but for one's own sake, so that the other person is deprived of it. So when we see somebody who has like a spiritual perfection, you know, there's a difference between jealousy and envy. Jealousy is when you have some perfection and you don't want anyone else to have it. Whereas envy is when someone else has something and you want it to their detriment. It's not spiritual envy if you see some perfection of somebody's and you desire it for yourself, but not to their loss. That actually can be a legitimate spiritual aspiration. Um, But the main thing we have to do is recognize that the Spirit gives as he wills. And so there are certain perfections that he gives to some people and not to others. And so this um, benignity keeps people from being spiritually envious. But this this is the one that helps us to do good for other people. And I'm afraid that, as I mentioned from the pulpit, that many traditionalists are more interested in beating up on people. You know, they'll come across somebody who says something contrary to what the church teaches, and their first inclination is to pull out the nightclub and just mm, over the top of the head, rather than thinking to themselves, you know, this person needs the spiritual work of mercy, of, of you know, of um, instructing the ignorant or admonishing the sinner or things of this sort. So there's a, instead of seeking what's good, they just would rather be the person on the head. And that, that's a sign of malice very often uh, because what happens is, is we suffer, the evil is present to our will because we're suffering. We're suffering some evil or some faith there. And that's what evil does. It causes suffering to us. So what ends up happening is because that evil is there, the person gets to the point where they become comfortable with it and they start willing it. In other words, they become malicious. They're seeking bad for people. So, and this usually arises because of anger. You know, something happens, they get angry and they club the person over the head and that feels good because of the vindication. And then so they, they, that gets perpetuated time and time again. And then it gets to the point where they just as soon go around beating everybody up as opposed to help anybody. Okay. So you have to be really careful about that. But as you become holier, the person's inclination is not to do that anymore.
You know, I don't want to beat up on people. I want to help people. The only time you're going to, you know, as St. Thomas says, the only time you punish somebody is for the sake of the medicinal side of things or to protect other people, and that's the only time the person's willing to do it. But he would rather do, you know, do the good things for people. The next is meekness, sometimes called mildness. Meekness is the fruit by which one endures with equanimity, the la- that is, a lack of disturbance interiorly, the evils which one's neighbor inflicts on him by inhibiting anger. In other words, as a person becomes more holy, people can just treat him like garbage, and he doesn't get angry from it. He's just, he, doesn't, he doesn't go to extreme in his reactions. Meekness is a fruit of the Holy Ghost, but it's also a virtue. It's the virtue by, it's the opposite of anger. It's the virtue by which one's, ex, one's um, uh, reactions are tempered. So one doesn't go to extreme in one's reactions. Meekness is the fruit in which one refrains from acts of anger or from going to extremes. Hence, by meekness one exercises proper self-restraint in the face of injury. Meekness is contrary to envy since one refrains from harming those who are in possession of the good which is seen as an evil to oneself. Those who suffer from anger, while they cannot gain this fruit directly, because the only way you get the fruit, you now you can work on the virtue, but you can't, you know, gain the fruit directly. All you can do is increase your how much grace you have, sanctifying grace, and then it'll become more operative. Um, but what they will find is as they begin to seek holiness more, that this will naturally overtake their soul, and they'll just become meek in the process with hardly any effort at, at all, usually. In other words, it's one of those things that just, you know, people say, I'm really struggling with anger. They might manage to get temperance. So they don't have problems relating to the Sixth and Ninth Commandments. and They get the food under control and things of that sort. But then they start finding, okay, now I've got all this anger to deal with. Um, and so sometimes they'll struggle and struggle and struggle against it. But one of the ways to, to deal with it is acts of charity, that is, increase the amount of, to increase the amount of sanctifying grace by doing charitable works. And then what will happen is the person will just become naturally meek on their own. The next is faith. Faith in respect to the fruit can be taken in two ways. In the first way, the fruit is that which we do, not har- we do no harm to our neighbor, either through fraud or deceit. And in this sense, faith is taken as fidelity. In other words, the person's trustworthy. As a person becomes more holy, they naturally become more trustworthy. They're more faithful to doing what they're supposed to do because they will always be faithful to God's commands. So they're reliable. And this is one of the reasons why when people say we've got to get religion out of the public sector, we've got to get this talk about morality out of the public sector, all you're going to do is render people untrustworthy in the end. As one seeks the good of the other, then this fruit makes one trustworthy. For one knows that a person in whom this fruit is operative will never do anything against their spiritual well-being. The second way this, is, this fruit is something that's taken as faith in which one believes in God. Man is ordered to that which is above himself, and thereby man subjects his intellect and all that is his to God. Since this fruit subjects one intellectually to God, it grants certitude to faith. So what that means is as a person becomes holier, you become more certain of the teachings of the church. That's what it means. When you see people, I don't really know what the church, I don't know if I believe what this is, what the church is, that's usually a sign that there's a moral problem too. And that's something that really needs to be, um, not, it's not always a necessary connection, but it's a sign that there's something lacking in their spiritual life. Whereas if they're really advancing in charity, if they're really becoming holier, then the faith becomes much clearer to them and they see things much more clearly and with much more certitude. <clears throat> so you can tell people, you know, if you're doubting a particular teaching of the church, just work on becoming holier, and that'll begin to evaporate. The next is modesty. Now, as you know from my homilies, modesty is a much broader virtue than just those things pertaining to the Sixth and Ninth Commandments. The fruit of the Holy Ghost of modesty disposes man well to exterior actions in which he observes due mode in what he says and does. Modesty governs man's external actions so that he does what he ought, when he ought, and how he ought to do it. So it's the thing that makes sure that all my external actions are always measured or under control and done in the right way. In the medieval period, the virtue of modesty was one that governs one's externals, and this pertains not to just one's dress, as in the modern sense of the term, but also the forms of externals from dress to possessions, which is part of the virtue of simplicity, 
um, to what we say, in other words, how we speak and that type of thing is more measured, and what we do. So a person will never do anything to draw other people into sin and that type of thing. Hence, for St. Thomas, it is a broader virtue than is sometimes taken today. However, since the fruit is an act and not a virtue, the fruit of the Holy Ghost of modesty makes one modest in speech, action, and dress. So in other words, as people become holier, they start gaining a greater sense of modesty, not just with respect to their dress, although that's part of it, but it actually it starts their speech patterns and that type of thing become more measured, they talk less, that type of thing. For this reason, it is contrary to drunkenness and revelings, St. Thomas says, by which we do not govern rightly our exterior comportment, Furthermore, it refrains from delight in riches and honors. It refrains from dress, which is inappropriate, either by excess or defect. So, you know, the woman who's very modest doesn't come with the hat that's got the great big ostrich feather sticking out of it type of thing. It protects from defect in those cases where one does not wear enough clothing to protect either oneself or others from sins against the Sixth and Ninth Commandments. It refrains from excess as when one wants to wear too much makeup or excessively expensive clothing that is not suited to one's state in life, or by moderating the use of jewelry according to a person in time. So in other words, as a person becomes holier, their externals begin to become more measured and more appropriate, so you don't see them doing strange things when they shouldn't. Okay. The next is continence. This can be taken in two ways. In one way, continence is taken as refraining from things that are licit, that is, permissible. So, for example, the person um, refrains from you know, eating too much food or eating, eating a certain amount of food on a particular day or something of that sort. In this respect, the continent man is one who uses licit things with due moderation, so you don't eat too much, and who practices self-denial even in regard to those things which are morally permissible. In another way, continence is taken as suffering concupiscence but not being led into sin. So basically what St. Thomas says is, is that continence is the virtue in the will in which even if your appetites are all over the place, your emotions are all over the place, the person, because of this virtue in the will, remains steadfast in doing what's right. So the continent man, what happens is, is you become more holy then what happens is even if there's an emotionally upsetting situation, the person can still f remain focused on doing the right thing even though it's difficult. And that's, a, that's an important virtue, uh, which is different from chastity, which we'll see here in just a minute. But this is important because this is something that you, know, you have to teach teenagers, you have to teach people, because continence always comes, usually, usually comes before chastity. Because the person, because of hormones, you know, they rage, and so the person desires things that are illicit, um, or even if they desire things that are licit, it helps the person to remain steadfast in doing what's right despite the fact that there's this emotional upheaval. Then the last is chastity. Chastity pertains to interior concupiscences or desires. And for that reason, it is also maybe taken in two ways. In the first way, chastity is taken as refraining from things that are illicit. In other words, first the virtue, then we'll get to how the fruit of the Holy Ghost works. The, the gift, or the fruit, or the, sorry, the virtue of chastity is a virtue in what we call the concupiscible appetite. The concupiscible appetite is the, is the appetite that desires food and conjugal relations. And the, that is bodily goods taken broadly speaking. And chastity is the virtue that's in that particular faculty of ours that desires or inclines us towards these things. And it moderates it. It keeps it from pursuing things. So how do I know I have the virtue of chastity? easy. I don't have what they call antecedent appetite, which I've already talked about. That is, I don't get emotional before I have a chance to think about it or contrary to the way I think. Whereas the person who's chaste, his concupiscible appetite never moves until reason says, okay, this is something to listen to desire. So the chaste man never desires conjugal relations outside of when they are permissible. And so that, mean, and that means he has no emotional inclination towards it except for insofar as it's rightly ordered. That's something that's difficult for, to achieve for people in our culture because of the fact that we are so dysfunctional. That's the virtue. Now, the fruit, of course, is one in which uh, the person doesn't suffer. Um, not that, that becomes active. That is, the virtue of chastity becomes much more active um, because it's the act of chastity, that is, the, the appetites are actively restrained. That is, as a person becomes holier, they're just kept in check, period. 
Chastity is manifested when the concupiscible appetite does not move towards that which is illicit or contrary to God's law. As a result, one is not led into sin, as well as in those cases when one simply lacks illicit desires. One of the fruits of the Holy Ghost is not to have illicit desires and to be moved only to that which is chaste. In this respect, chastity helps one to make right use of what is considered licit. So the difference, of course, between continence and chastity is, is continence is in, is in the will, so that even if the person is having strong inclinations towards those things of the Sixth Commandment, he can still remain steadfast and say no to it. Whereas chastity is in the appetite, and it keeps the appetite from actually moving towards those things, except when it's permissible. And so that's when you know the person's chaste. Now let's back up and re re review something. This means that as a person becomes holier, leading a chaste life gives the person a great deal of joy. Now if you were to say that on national television, half your audience would pass out with a brain hemorrhage because it's just completely contrary to our entire thinking today. And what's this a sign of? It's a sign that the Holy Ghost isn't active in a lot of people's lives because people just aren't leading lives of chastity. But it's also a sign of um, perfection. And it doesn't mean, mean that you don't make use of, those, of conjugal relations within the context of marriage, it's just that it's moderated and there's a great, de a great deal of delight in its moderation within the context. But as for someone who's celibate, such as myself, there's a great joy that the person takes in being celibate. When you tell people there is a joy in celibacy, you're just like, mm. they just get these weird looks. You know, they're just, they, they just can't imagine it. And that's part of it because that's the way people's habits function. When you're always thinking about something, you know, you can't imagine everyone else not always thinking about that thing because why? Well, you're imagining those other people thinking about that thing because you're always thinking about it. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's, and so, but the point is, is that as a person becomes holier, the chastity just tends to come into place. And so one of the, is a, and this is, you'll, you'll talk to people who are advancing, you know, they might have struggled with chastity when they're younger, but as they become holier, the chastity just starts to, the issues of chastity begin to get put on the back burner because they're just not an issue anymore. They just start fading. It doesn't mean from time to time they don't come up because God allows us, as long as we're in this life, to suffer temptations of, of virtually any of the possible vices because it's necessary to maintain acquired virtue in this life. Because if we don't, then we start losing the acquired virtue if we don't practice it. And that's why God allows temptations in these areas. So even after a person reaches a high degree of chastity, they might suffer these temptations, but it's either to increase their virtue or to maintain it. And that's why God allows it. But when the person does the chaste thing in the face of the temptation, there's a joy in it that results from it. All these fruits ensure right order of the soul. In other words, it orders us interiorly. So as we become more holy, our interior lives become more orderly. We're less emotional, we're less, um, you know, dysfunctional, and that type of thing. We actually start, we start feeling better about ourselves. You know, from time to time you'll get people say, the problem with that person is they have low self-esteem. Well, that's a good thing. In certain people's cases, they ought to have low self-esteem. Because of the fact, well, first of all, uh, this one professor of mine one time said, he says, you know, they're teaching pride in the universities now, and they call it self-esteem. And that's basically what it boils down to. So you get that problem. But the other time is, when people are leading sinful lives, they shouldn't walk around and think to themselves, how great I am. You're a wretch. You know, you should be getting your act together. All right. So you got that problem. But uh, the, the point in all this is, as a person begins to become holier, their interior life becomes much more orderly. And so there's a much more joy taken in the spiritual life, and there's, things are just, life is much better. We can use the fruits as a gauge to determine how much charity we have. How holy are you? I mean, how operative are these things in your life? You know, do you take delight in being modest and incontinent, or you know, incontinent, <laughs> incontinent? Do you take delight in chastity? And, you know, do you, do you, are the things of the faith really clear to you? Do they have certitude about them? All right, so if we don't have them or if these things are weak, that's a sign we haven't reached perfection and we have to start, again, rooting out our imperfections. And then as we do that, our prayer life will begin to advance, we'll become, we start ascending the levels of prayer, these things become more operative and our life is just much happier. Okay, any question? Yes. Uh, all this stuff is, is due to a lack of, of, of to, uh, to uh, 
original sin, isn't it? You yes, problems. that's right. The, all the interior disorders that we re, that we suffer from is due to original sin initially, and then actual, our own sin, which further disorders us. So that's why we have to stop the sinning. And the remedy for the order, the way we become more interiorly ordered, is through virtue, and both infused and then otherwise. And then it's also as we um, become holier that these things tend to order us even further. But the biggest, the, one of the principal things about this that I wanted to stress is that it actually gives the person delight in these things, so that leading the life, uh, a good moral life, is actually enjoyable. But yeah, it's because of original sin. We can thank Adam and Eve for that one, I guess. But I don't want to speak too much against Adam and Eve because the pious tradition is that Adam and Eve actually made it to heaven. That after they had eaten the apple and realized the error of their ways, which must have been rather stark, you know, they must have woke up the next morning like, oh, what happened, you know. But, but anyway, the, uh, they did a lot of penance. The tradition was they did a lot of penance and prayer, um, and as a result, um, God spared them and saved them. So uh, I don't want to speak too ill of them, so... Yeah. Okay, on the, uh, your website or that, to get to this, Don has tried to get to some of your talks before, and he has totally lost on board. <laughs> okay, well, first, my website, of course, is um, censustraditionalist.com. I should probably pick an easier name. The only reason I picked this is because I actually like, that's an I, I actually like what this means. Census traditionalist means a sense of tradition that there's, the tradition is the passing on of good things to us, and so we should have a sense for the necessity for that and the good of that. But it's censusproducers.org, and if you go to multimedia, there's a, ta- a series of tabs on the top that will say, like, online text, offline text, multimedia, devotional. If you click on that, if you click on the multimedia, you'll get a rather lengthy page of conferences and sermons and that type of thing. And, the spiritual theology classes, the first three are on there. I should get these two up there probably within about a week and a half. So, and then you can just download those. It's penance where, of course, so if you do it, you've got to give me a dollar, which I actually had somebody do, which by the time PayPal gets done with it, you don't have too much money. <laughs> but, or, you, or you do a decade of the rosary um, for my intentions, not necessarily for me, but for my intentions. So. Yeah. So, Father, if there's been like a thousand, then you have to pay PayPal about a thousand dollars. I haven't made that kind of money. So, either people are committing sacrilegious theft by pirating my <laughs> conferences, or people are doing an awful lot of praying, and I think that's really the case. I think a lot of people are just praying. Well, if you'll kneel, I'll give you a blessing. Benedictio de omnipotentis, patris et fili et spiritus et sin, super vos et mani et semper. Amen. <laughs>